From a systems perspective, I believe that culture is the how. If you think about your vision or your mission, whatever you want to call it, or your charter or your purpose, that's your why. You know, that's kind of your long-term play. It's why you exist in the world, why you get up in the morning, why people are doing what they're doing. Then there's the strategy, you know, that's the what. What are you focused on? What is expected of people to get the outcomes and the results that we want? And then the culture is the how. How are we doing this? How are we working together? Welcome to the Learn Podcast, where we interview top leaders in tech and learn about how they're building the world's most innovative companies. I'm Ted Blosser, CEO and co-founder of WorkRamp, the world's first learning cloud platform. Our mission is to help professionals reach their full potential through learning. And the Learn Podcast is where we can learn from the best leaders at the top of their game. Please subscribe, leave us a rating, and we hope you enjoy the episode. Everyone, welcome back to the Learn Podcast. We have a special guest on today, Melissa Daimler from Udemy. She's the chief learning officer there. And uh, Melissa, excited to have you on the show today. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, let's start off with your elevator pitch. Tell us a little bit about your background. I've been in the industry for over 20 years now. I think if I talk about my career, one of the themes is I'm a systems thinker. So I've always thought about problems and every one of my jobs within the context of a system. Way back when I was at Adobe and was able to kind of start the organizational development function there, and then later kind of restart the learning function, that was really the context that we had. So how do we not just roll out more trainings or push our agenda onto the business, but you know, really take a step back and look at the total system and figure out what problems are we trying to solve? How do we help the business and teams and individuals be more effective? So that was kind of the thread throughout my whole career. And of course, I've always been interested within that system around culture. It really is how work happens, how work gets done. And when you can connect all the parts and really see the value of culture tied with strategy and purpose, that's just magic in an organization. And so I saw a lot of that magic happen at Adobe, was able to kind of take what I learned from the almost 11 years there into Twitter and really kind of build the from the ground up, like what the learning and OD function was there for four and a half years, was there for the IPO. And just it was a great time for Twitter, just a lot of growth internally across the teams. We scaled across the globe as well. And then I had what I can say now is an opportunity to see what happens when you don't pay attention to culture at WeWork. So made it a year, tried my best, failed. It was such a great lesson for me to kind of understand, again, the importance of tying strategy with culture. And it was really what lit my fire to write this book and to make sure people understood the importance of culture with strategy. And then after some consulting time with companies around culture, had the opportunity, Udemy came calling and said, hey, we're looking at bringing in somebody to help us, again, think about that whole system and where learning fits into that. So can you come talk about your book, really help us, but also help our customers think about learning again in the context of that greater organizational culture context. So I've been at Udemy now for a couple of years and I love it. And you and I were just talking about the fact that we don't just get to develop our employees internally, but I also get to talk to a lot of customers and really be a thought leader for them around building great learning organizations and great cultures. Yeah. Saying that's such a great superpower of you to me to have someone like yourself be able to provide that thought leadership to customers, prospects. So it's great to have you in that regard at Udemy. Question for you, actually, before we jump into the meat of it, you talked about Twitter. You talked about WeWork, who have very influential CEO slash founders. Did you learn anything about the intersection of strong-willed or influential founders and culture? It's probably a tough question to answer, but I'm curious if you learned anything from those two experiences. I do think the good founders, I mean, I credit Jack a lot here, Jack Dorsey with Twitter. I think the good ones 
are able to let go of how it was and even kind of bring forward all the goodness that is working. That's one of the things that so many founders get concerned about. Like, how do we bring the magic and the culture along this growth path and let go of some of the things that we know don't work? And so that's one of the things that I talk about in the book is I think you can still have your core culture and the essence of that, but maybe how it's expressed is different. I'll give you an example. That's one of the many ways that we work went wrong. I think one of the core practices that they did was bring together people, the entire company, they had these gatherings, it was called summer camp. And I think when it was 20 people in a backyard with a barbecue and a volleyball net, that was great. But it, when it's 5,000 people over the course of three days and you're putting people in teepees that don't know each other, that's a little scary. If one of the values is connection or teamwork or gathering, how do we express that in perhaps a different way than through that particular practice? So again, I think you can have consistent values and bring the essence of what's working in a company along, but you have to be willing to let go of some things. And I think every good founder that I've worked with is able to toggle both of those. That's a great learning. Could imagine being on the HR team during summer camp. (laughs) They're probably freaking out. So I saw that on, I think the documentary, I was thinking that would not be a good spot. It's our nightmare. Yes. To be on the people team. So, okay, let's jump into the first big topic, which is culture or reculturing in your words behind you. You have a few of those books as well for the audience. Melissa published a best-selling book around culture. Can you give us the core tenets of reculturing, how it maybe maps back to your systems experience you were just talking about? And I might ask a follow-up here from those core tenants. I think one of the reasons I wrote it, as I said, is because I felt like In 2016, when I left WeWork, I couldn't believe that I was witnessing some of what I was seeing. And I, again, tried to influence as much as I could. And we made some changes there, but the system had so much momentum at the time with some of the leaders there. It was hard. And so I think one of the reasons I wrote this book is because I felt it was important to write about culture from a practitioner's perspective. So from an operating viewpoint, because so many of the other books on culture and everything I read, the research articles and the papers and other books were written by people who frankly had never stepped into an organization. There were so many other ones and they would talk about it in theory and they would talk about how culture is this belief or mindset or It's all about creating fun and happiness in an organization. And I just felt like we did a disservice to HR and to people leaders in general on the power of what culture is and can be in an organization. And I also just frankly got not only frustrated, but it was just confusing. I mean, just a lot of frameworks and models that just weren't useful and practical. So I wanted to write something that was useful, that it was essentially a playbook for anybody to take uh, an employee or a leader into their organization and be able to take action on it right away. I think from a systems perspective, I believe that culture is the how. If you think about your vision or your mission, whatever you want to call it, or your charter or your purpose, that's your why. You know, that's kind of your long term play. It's why you exist in the world, why you get up in the morning, why people are doing what they're doing. Then there's the strategy. You know, that's the what. What are you focused on? What is expected of people to get the outcomes and the results that we want? And then the culture is the how. How are we doing this? How are we working together? We've probably both experienced, a lot of people experience those colleagues or employees on your team who kick butt on the results, they just nail it, but they're the worst team player or they're condescending or they're not bringing people along. And so that how is so important. So I think it's really important to connect all of those pieces. And so often I feel like leaders are either focused too much on the strategy or there are leaders who focus too much on the how. 
A lot of HR leaders, in my experience, do that. They're not as much focused on the results. And that's not great either. I think that connection between all of those parts creates a much stronger opportunity for the company to be successful. And then within culture, it's behaviors, processes, practices. That's how I talk about culture. So going beyond values and really thinking through and being explicit about what are those behaviors that you want to show up in your organization that would exemplify your values. So I always give the example of innovation is a great value. A lot of companies have it, but your company might mean something very different than innovation at my company. Your company might mean we want to go faster. We want to get V1 out there. We want to prototype. I may say, you know what? We're going too fast. We're spending way too much money. We have a lot of bad ideas that are getting through. I want to slow it down. I want to actually ask more questions. So behavior that I might have for innovation could be we ask more questions. And I actually worked with a company who did that. And so they would ask more questions and they would ask why specifically in meetings. And that was a signal for, okay, hold on. We got to slow this down because we don't want to go where we went before. So I just think behaviorally, you need to really identify no more than 10 to 12 behaviors across an organization that you want to reinforce through, and that's the second piece, processes, how you hire, how you onboard, how you reward, how you give coaching and feedback, performance management. So if those behaviors are then embedded into behavioral questions and then in how you promote and how you reward people, that is such a great kind of forcing function to ensure that you're living your culture. And then the practice piece is more of this day-to-day stuff. So how you meet, how you connect, how you communicate. There's such an opportunity to kind of reinforce your behaviors in things that you do there. We have at Udemy, no surprise, one of our values is always learning. But one of our behaviors we realized was we engage in constructive debate because we realized that that's where we learn is when we push back on each other and we share an opposing viewpoint. And so I try as much as possible in meetings and when we're talking with one another for various projects to kind of give an opposing viewpoint if nobody else does. Like, I just want to test this. We kind of create what we call productive friction to make sure that we're thinking about this in a very holistic way and that we're learning before we make any mistakes, ideally, like what could be another way to think about this earlier on in the process. That's kind of how I think about culture. Let me ask you this. So if I got the dates correctly, I saw you published the book in mid-2022. I'm assuming you came up with a lot of the frameworks, put pen to paper in 2021. And if you think about that, you were writing a lot of this, but I'm sure you had the thoughts in an era where there was high growth. It was a zero interest rate policy era. So the world was different when you were writing this. And when you published it, the world changed also dramatically. So if you had to, let's say, write an addendum to reculturing today and how you've seen the world change in 2023 and the back half of 2022, when you think about behavior, process, practice, does it change any parts of that framework? One of those, for example, just lived differently now in this new environment, would you say? What's so interesting is that I think the hybrid model that we live in now with the workplace reinforces what I'm saying about culture even more. I always said that it's not about happy hours. It's not about the ping pong tables. It's not about what's at an office. It's agnostic of any office because it is how we work with each other. And I think the silver lining to the pandemic was, oh, wow, we can design and build and more intentionally create culture every day because it is an active, I always say it's a practice. It is a verb, not a noun. It's something we do and we can do that virtually wherever we are. So I feel like it reinforced that, you know, I am thinking about another book. It is more around how do you move from, I have a chapter in the book about this. I'd like to talk about it more behaviors to skills because so many of the organizations are talking about skills-based organization now. And at Twitter, we started doing this. We called it org skills at the time. But if these are the behaviors, if a constructive debate is an example, is one of our behaviors, 
one of the things that we're building at Udemy as a skill is how do you debate? What is a good debater? Like, how do I ask good questions? How do I listen? How do I share with you a point of view and respectfully counter another one? And so I think the link between behaviors and skills is something that a lot of organizations aren't fully taking advantage of. That's spot on. When you were talking about behaviors, the first thing I was thinking about was Ray Dalio's book, which is his principles book. And one thing I realized is those are essentially behaviors in your definition of it. But then I was thinking about Ray Dalio as an individual and with Bridgewater was he could never get a replacement. He could never find a good successor. It clicked with me as like, maybe it's because He's not focusing on the skills and the developing of people. He's kind of focusing too much on the behaviors. And maybe that is a reason why organizations fail in succession plans or like driving the right behaviors because you don't have the right skills. I do think that we are trying to shift from what is the job, what is the role to what is the work? What is the work we're trying to get done? And then if we look at it in that context, there are probably three to five skills that meet, like in this example, what are the skills that had Ray be so successful? You got to get more specific than leadership. Was it asking good questions? Was it being a clear communicator? So I think there's a strong link there that you can even tie to your learning strategy that reinforces culture. Everyone, we're on the podcast right now with Melissa Daimler, the CLO at Udemy, and we're talking about skills-based organizations and also how to improve culture at your company. If you're looking at building a skills-based organization, look no further to WorkRamp. WorkRamp is the all-in-one learning cloud, which can help instill the critical skills you need in your workforce. If you want to learn more about the learning cloud, visit us at workramp.com. Back to the episode. In my research, I saw you just presented on skills at the Udemy conference, and I love to understand your viewpoint on, you have the acronym of SBO, Skills-Based Organizations. Give us kind of the more in-depth philosophy on skills-based organizations heading into next year. What are you evangelizing out to your customer base or potential future customers? I think... A lot of companies are trying to figure out what this is. And I think some people have said, well, gosh, it's what we've been trying to figure out for years. You're just applying the word skills on it because way back when I've been doing this for a while, we used to talk about competencies and how we're thinking about this hasn't totally changed. But I think the word skill and the fact that we're getting much more precise about what we expect and want from employees is allowing us to build much more specific and precise systems around it. I think also what's different than when we first started grappling with is our tech stacks. So the opportunity to leverage different systems to embed skills and to make sure that they connect with other technology across the organization. I mean, there are so many companies now kind of helping with internal mobility as an example. How do we, again, not just think about internal mobility as moving from one job to another, but what about projects? What about gigs? What about initiatives that are maybe just three months or six months long? Could I have somebody kind of work on that project and leverage 80% of the skills we need, even though I know 20% of those skills aren't there, but they can develop those. So it's a twofer because I'm getting my project done and I know they get to develop as an employee too. So we talk about four things. One, tied to the strategy. So how everything we're doing right now at a strategic level is around thinking about our skills and our people processes. So again, going back to hiring, onboarding, performance managing, can we pull out the specific behaviors and skills that are needed across all of those processes. When we look at our career leveling framework from IC to VP and the criteria for what it takes to be a successful leader here, what are the skills needed across each of those levels? And I think from a technology stack, do we have a technology strategy that is fully integrated with our skills strategy? And then we're also just looking at 
the personas or employee segments. So what do we expect of every people manager here in terms of skills? Is that different or the same as a leader? What do we expect from a leader in engineering? Is there another layer of technical skills on that? So how do you kind of make sure that employees are super clear about the behaviors and skills that they're expected to have and do? And then how do we then figure out ways if there is a gap to develop those skill sets? You were talking about how people have kind of swung in two directions. Some are just so performance driven and some are too culture driven. And it sounds like it needs to be a nice balance of the two. Where do you think skills comes into play in terms of driving performance? So I'll give a simple example. When we talk to clients, you have to kind of convince them like, hey, you need to learn to improve. And a lot of times they say, I'm too busy to learn. I just need to go close that next deal, right? Where's the importance of skills come into play as it relates to driving performance in an organization? That is exactly full circle back to why I think it's important to look at your organization as a system. If you're bringing up learning opportunities or trainings or doing this workshop that's separate from skills I know I need to either execute on in my job today or I know I need to develop in order to be promoted, I'm not going to bother. But if you tell me that these are the skills that are really important for your job today. Here's where I think you're doing well. And here's where I think you develop. And here are some learning opportunities and experiences that I want you to be part of that are directly going to help you be more successful in your job today. And I'm going to help you get that promotion. You bet I'm going to make time for that. That is then a context for me that is part of my job and my work. The context is no longer what you just said, which is it's on top of my day job. Like I don't have time for that because it's an extra thing I need to do versus I think our job as learning leaders especially is to integrate and connect those learning opportunities with the skills people need to develop. Do you have a rule of thumb or have you seen really great companies who think about, hey, how much time should I be spending on developing skills or learning, whether that is expressed in a percentage, like, hey, if you're working time, you should be spending 5% just developing or in a cadence that you've seen work really well for top performing. Do you ever give recommendations like that to other people leaders or even CXOs? No, because I think everybody's different. And I think learning shows up in so many different ways now. It's like putting the broccoli in between the the brownie. Like you and I both listen to podcasts like this. I'm learning so much. Like some of them admittedly are on 2X, but there's some where I slow it down, where I rewind. There's fun stuff too, but like so many podcasts, Audible, YouTube, we're always learning there. You know, I read as much as I can. I always say behind every good writer is a good reader. I learn best and we know this and there's a ton of studies on this, which is one of the reasons why we have a whole cohort model that we're really driving toward at at Udemy is you learn so much from your peers. So even if both of us watch the same thing or we're part of the same learning opportunity and experience, you will get something different than I will get. And then when we practice what we learn, we'll have a different experience that we can then bring back and share with each other. And I will learn even more because you executed on it and practiced it with an employee in a little different context than I did. And so one of the things I always talk about and with my own team, I think that our weekly team meetings, we learn every week. We say like, what did we learn this week? Or we're all going through every quarter, we pick a different topic. It was AI. But we had learning paths that we all went through and were responsible to get through. But then every week, we looked forward to that conversation. Hey, what prompts did you use this week? How did you word that? Or how did we actually create an assessment together? We saved $15,000 and did it in three days versus three months through chat GPT. And so we're now this quarter, it's on skills-based orgs. We have a whole list of things that we're learning. But then when we talk about it and think about how we can apply it, 
that to me is where the richness and the value of learning comes into play. Like, how are we taking what we just learned and applying it in our day-to-day work? I heard a quote on the Dr. Huberman podcast of Strummer's Law, no input, no output. And if you're not learning, you're not going to be able to be creative and have good output. And I went through my calendar for the week and I said, hey, roughly how many meetings are input meetings where I'm learning, just like you were just talking about, you're learning in these meetings and how many meetings are output meetings in my work day. And it was about a third was only input and a two thirds output. I wonder if it's different for not CEOs, but it was interesting to take stock of your calendar and just be like, all right, how much of the time am I actually learning? I'm sure you, you're doing a lot of output, like as people look to learn from you. I wonder if you personally struggle, like, all right, who else is at the top of the mountain above me that I can learn from? I'm such a big fan of working in your day-to-day, but then working on it. I really do try to not jam my days with back-to-back meetings so that, especially now, we are coming into the office a couple of days a week and I learn so much about my team and what's going on in the organization just by making sure I take moments in between meetings and walk around and have a little bit of breathing space between. We can't learn and take more information in if we don't allow for that space for it to happen in. All right, Melissa, let's close out with our learn rapid fire round. This is where I'll ask you just a few questions. I'd love to get one or two line answers for each. First one I'm going to ask you is what's the hardest thing you learned from writing a top selling book that you didn't expect? The ability to be consistent. So you had to keep writing, even if you thought I have nothing left. So you had to have writing be a practice every day. So I actually just from five to eight every morning, I shifted my workout to later in the day and I would just sit. And there were days where not a lot came out, but just the practice of being there and knowing that that was a forcing function. I learned that you have to have a habit of writing if you're going to get that book done. It's a huge time commitment. All right, next one. One tip, and we talked a little about this earlier, for making space for learning in your day-to-day? I think first, just being clear about what it is you want to learn. So we share with my team, like what is a skill that we all are trying to develop? And then what support do we need from each other? So I think first being clear about what it is you're trying to learn. And then we did talk about that, you know, making space for you to learn that. Last question. You've had an amazing career and you have so much left to go as well, but what is one tip you would give to aspiring L&D leaders who want to get to the top of the, let's call it the learning mountain. What would be your one tip? My one tip, and I wrote about in the book, is a tip that Donna Morris gave to me years ago, is that no matter what function you're leading, you are always a business leader first. So be really clear about the business that you're in, the way you make revenue, all of the issues that the company is trying to address and make sure that you're connected into that. I love that. Actually, a lot of people don't think of the world that way. They think about their role first and then the business maybe third. But I love the reverse psychology around that. Melissa, thanks so much. This was an awesome conversation. Really enjoyed it. And I appreciate you being on the Learn Podcast. Thank you. This was fun. Thanks for listening to the Learn Podcast. If you're a fan of the podcast, do us two favors. One is subscribe to it so you can get the latest updates for our most recent episodes. And two, write a short review of the podcast. This helps us get discovered in the broader podcast community. Thanks again.